Um, the talk today is being delivered by Phil Green. Um, this is, I think, about the third or fourth we've done in the series one, yeah. now. Um, so uh, we've been going through different topics um, in this area. Today we're talking about um, valves for ductile iron <coughs> pipelines. Uh, and the plan for today is that uh, Phil's presentation will run for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A at the end of the session, um, aiming to be wrapped up by about five to two. And we'd ask that you, if you do have questions, if you submit them in the Q&A box, um, and we can then field the questions uh, at the end of the talk. Um, so... Without further ado, I'm, I'm going to hand over to Phil and I say thanks to Phil for giving his time today. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's let's go from here. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Sheila. So, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about valves um, for ductile line pipelines. So <clears throat> basically the object of the uh, presentation today is to improve understanding of our, how, how valves work and how and where they should be used on a, on a network or a pipeline. Um, Valves are essential components of any pipeline. They're, they have a number of uses. They're used to control flow uh, and pressure, to allow air to escape from the line, to prevent backflow, and to al allow access uh, to water supply for firefighting. So on this presentation today, I'm going to use a simple pipeline illustration to demonstrate where valves uh, are, should be placed or ought to be placed um, and why they should be placed, and then a, a flavour of some of the valves that are available from Sangaman Pam to, to suit some of these, uh, some of these applications. So if we look at, a, a, I guess, a simple pipeline system, we'll start off in a, in a, in a wet well uh, and a pumping system. Um, so <clears throat> when you've got um, um, a pipe, in a, pipe in a well, um, you need to um, understand that they're, they're prone to air and air must be removed for safety and efficiency to protect equipment uh, and compressed air. Um, you can get compressed air from a pump uh, on a pump at startup. Um, and, and you can get a vortex at, um, at pump suction. If the head of the pump suction is, uh, is, a, is a, a, in the well is low, a vortex is formed uh, above the suction of the pipe and air is drawn directly into the pump, hence, uh, hence into the pipeline. So there's a number of ways in which air can get into a pipeline from a pump. So the first thing we need to look at is um, whether we put an air valve on a pipeline. Um, so an air valve or a purge valve is a device installed at locations along a line to allow entrapped air to be exhausted to the atmosphere. Uh, and basically air valves perform, uh, excuse me, air valves perform three main functions. They release air in bulk when the pipeline has been filled with water. Um, they release accumulated air continuously whilst the pipeline is pressurized and in operation. And they allow bulk air back into the pipeline um, when the pipeline is draining down or to avoid a vacuum leading to a potential collapse of the pipeline if there's a if there's a uh, a mains failure somewhere along the line so they're the main functions of a of a of a pipeline uh, sorry of, a, of, a, of an air valve in a pipeline so <clears throat> basically all three of these functions are performed by double air valves um, so this is an illustration of a double air valve you've got a large uh, a large chamber in the middle uh, and you've got a small orifice on the left hand side there so all of these functions are performed by this particular valve so during the filling of the pipe the air evacuates out of the top of the valve uh, but the float remains in a low position the float on the left remains at a low position um, and as the air evacuates water fills the line uh, and the air relief valve gradually closes on a ball valve causing the float to rise and seal against the edge of the ceiling ring, uh, thus, thus closing the, uh, the large orifice. And then the small pivot uh, float also raises with the water level to, to close the small um, orifice at the side. Now, <clears throat> what then happens uh, in operation and under pressure? You've got a unit which is sealed by the, the large orifice float valve and the, um, if you like, the ball valve on the left-hand side. It's under pressure and the orifices are, um, are sealed. Now, the air can accumulate um, in a pipeline during service, uh, and the low pressure float remains in place uh, in, the, in the main body of the valve, but the, the small ball valve acts to move up and down as air, um, air enters the valve, so enables the air to evacuate through the small orifice, um, which is not held shut by the pipeline pressure. So in the case, in the case of emptying, what then happens is the network um, empties or there's a rupture in the pipe, 
the low pressure air valve at the side opens and then the large orifice valve drops with the height of the water to allow bulk air back into the system so in simple terms that's how um, that's how a double air valve that's how a double air valve works and that's how we get air in and out of uh, in and out of valve systems so that's that's a, a double orifice air valve in its simplest form we can also have single large orifice air valves um, and basically what happens with these they release air in bulk during charging of the pipeline they generally remain closed while the pipeline is pressurized they operate at the minimum of 0.3 bar um, and then they admit <coughs> bulk air back into the pipeline when the pressure goes subatmospheric. So you don't always need a double orifice air valve. You can sometimes use a single large or a single small, and we'll look at single small uh, next. So a single small, you've got the, um, the ball valve rotating on a pivot there. Um, it has no effect on the bulk movement of air. Um, and basically, it's it's designed to release accumulated air in a pipeline under normal operating conditions. So when you're getting pumps starting and stopping and bubbles going into a pipeline, they'll escape through this small uh, single small orifice air valve. So there's a there's a uh, if you like a, a regulation of, of of air bubbles in a pipeline which get released through this uh, this small orifice. It's a similar scenario for sewage air valves. Um, <clears throat> basically, the, the purpose of a sewage purge valve is to remove air and sewer gases from a pipeline. It differs from a clean water air valve in that the float seating area at the top of the valve there uh, is isolated from the, the sewer liquor by means of a float um, on, a, on, a, on a pin for better, for, or a rod, which acts as uh, to operate the, the air valve above the, the ceiling area. Um, and the reason it's on a rod is it avoids any contamination of the ceiling area by uh, the contents of a foul uh, a foul sewage system. It keeps the ceiling area away from the liquor, basically. Um, so basically it acts in that top section of the valve to, to allow air to be released um, and it's isolated from the, from the actual sewage in the system. So it's, it's a very similar principle, but we, we avoid the um, the liquors touching the ceiling face on that one, so you don't contaminate the or you don't you don't affect the seal. In terms of um, determining the number of and size of air valves, there's a there's a chart here. Um, so when selecting the number and size, the line discharge pressure will depend on the filling rate desired, uh, and then dividing the filling rate of the pipeline by the number of large air valves on the installation gives the discharge rate required per valve. So on the on this illustration we've got here. The x-axis of the graph um, read up from the line discharge pressure chosen until it intersects the horizontal discharge value, uh, which is on the y-axis, and then select the next highest valve on the curve related to that particular design. So there's a there's a method to the um, the madness, if you like, in terms of choosing a choosing a valve uh, a valve type. So in this case, <clears throat> at, a, at a pressure of uh, half a bar and a discharge rate of 200 cubic meters per minute. The suggested air valve size in this particular instance will be a, a 150 a 150 air valve. So that's basically how this um, how this system or how this um, uh, capacity uh, reference works. <clears throat> so I guess the next question is where do you put air valves on a pipeline? So what we've got here is a is a is a sim is a simple illustration of a pipeline. You've got a pumping station on the left hand side there. You've got the topography. Um, of, of the land um, and then you've got the uh, the outlet end at the other end or a meter or whatever you want to call it at the other end um, so you've got lots of peaks and troughs within that pipeline but you've got an overall hydraulic gradient so we generally fit single large orifice air valves between the pump and the delivery check valve um, we generally fit air valves to peaks on a, on a pipeline system um, where a pipeline is parallel to the hydraulic gradient and um, we generally fit small orifice air valves every sort of 600 to 700 meters uh, with a double air valve um, at, at the ends and where you've got any sort of change in slope you fit a small uh, orifice air valve um, <clears throat> and you fit uh, it's well, it's good practice to fit air valves before any measuring instruments so at the end there where you've got a meter you might put a, a double air valve before there so you're getting a, a clean view of, of information being read through the meter you're not getting any turbulence of air going through a meter there it's all being vented before it goes through the meter uh, and as I mentioned earlier where straight sections occur um, these, these will also require venting at regular intervals and we generally work on a, a 600 to 700 meter um, run before you put uh, put air valves in again 
this isn't hard and fast rules, but this is general sort of best practice or good practice for venting a pipeline. I mean, there are some pipelines where air valves aren't used um, and they, 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 they can operate. The problem is if you don't have air valves where you need them, you can sometimes get um, an air pocket forming, um, particularly where you've got low oil gravity flow, we need to get up and over um, a gradient. Um, if you've got an air bubble forming, it tends to interrupt the flow, and it can um, and it can cause problems in your um, in your in your outcome flow and your your meter reading. So it's always good practice to consider certainly consider air valves and maybe not necessarily use them in all these instances, but make sure they've been considered. From a from a Sangaban perspective, here's some illustrations of of air valves that we uh, that we supply. On the left-hand side there, you've got a, a double air valve, double orifice air valve, <coughs> excuse me. Um, second from left, you've got a single orifice air valve, um, single small orifice air valve, should I say. Second from the right, you've got a single large orifice air valve. And on the right-hand side there, the red one is a, um, a, sewage, a sewage air valve. So that's a little bit of a discussion introduction about, about air valves. I guess onto the next piece here, where you have an air valve, you you want you might want to fit um, a horizontal butterfly valve, uh, a wafer or a little butterfly valve, to allow the air to be isolated, air valve to be isolated for maintenance. It's okay having an air valve, but you might want to take it off every now and again just to check that the the ball valves are working properly and the mechanics are right. So to do that, you need to isolate it. And again, we generally recommend you put a butterfly valve where you've got an air valve, so you can shut the line off, take the valve away, and then maintain that without any interruption to flow in the pipeline. So in terms of butterfly valves, um, the earliest type of butterfly valve was an all metal valve known as a throttle valve. It was basically a simple disc mounted on a spindle, which passed through the diameter and was mounted in a, in a cylindrical pipe. Um, and examples of this type of valves are um, a, lugged, uh, a, lugged, a lugged wafer type, where the valve is, is clamped into the pipeline between pipe flanges and has location lugs that em embrace the clamping bolts, or what we call a simple wafer type, uh, where the valve is just simply clamped into the pipeline between, between pipe ends or pipe flanges via long bolts. So they're two typical types of, um, of butterfly, um, hand-operated butterfly valves that are available and can be used. Um, and illustrations of the type of butterfly valves that Sangam and Pam can supply. On the left-hand side there, you've got the lugged version. On the right-hand side there, you've got the wafer version. As you can see, it's quite a simple operating valve. It's got a, um, a rubber encapsulated body with a metal gate uh, and a turning handle at the top that opens and closes that butterfly valve. So it's very simple operation, but quite effective for isolation of small, um, small diameter air valves. <clears throat> so back to our pipeline design. The next, um, the next product we'll look at is a, is a non-return valve. Um, and it's an, this, this is a device that's um, essential to ensure that the flow of the fluid takes place in the intended direction uh, and, and reverse flow is, uh, is prevented. Uh, and it's in its simplest form, it's known as a non-return valve or a check valve. Um, again, these are important because often if you've got a wet well, you'll have a pump at the bottom of a well, which is quite an expensive piece of kit. That pump is designed, has fins on it to, to drive water in one direction. When you stop um, stop the flow of a pump, what you can get sometimes, if you haven't got a non-return valve there, is backflow, and that can go back into the pump, and it might damage the fins on the pump if you don't prevent that backflow. So it's always we'd always recommend, or it's good practice, to put a non-return valve there to prevent that backflow, to isolate the pump and protect it from the water hammer of any um, any stop in uh, in operation. Basically, what an air valve return, what a non-return valve looks like uh, is, is this in cross section. It has a free acting, free hanging, free hanging door acting on a suspended hinge, which is opened by the forward flow uh, of the water. And when that flow stops, the hinge um, closes and gravity uh, closes the gate as the flow diminishes. So that's just, that's basically how this uh, how this works. It's not got any mechanical closing parts on it. It's it's operated by uh, water pressure and gravity to close it. <clears throat> so basically, um, swing check valves are designed for use uh, with water, oil, and contaminated liquors. Um, anything that might be regarded as a, as a, as a no Newtonian fluid, basically. Um, 
and in, and in practical terms, um, the standard check valve is unsuitable for sludge handling due to contamination of the internal bearings. So we'd oft, we'd, we generally recommend that you don't use these with um, fairly heavy sludge in a sewer 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 system. Uh, we generally reckon that they're used with um, water and probably treated effluents or final treated effluents to prevent any um, let's say um, clogging up of, of of the of the hinge process and the gates by um, any sludge that might be in the in the medium that you that you're using now non-return valves that can be used in both horizontal and vertical positions um, and they might be fitted with an external lever and weight system to, to assist in achieving tight closure when downstream pressures are relatively low uh, especially with a rubber face gate so as I as it mentions there, you can you can have them in both positions, and and what we've got in red there is basically the, the lever and weight, uh, and basically what this does, it acts as a, a weight to aid the closing process of the gate valve, um, to ensure that it, it shuts tightly and it shuts correctly um, when the water flow stops. Um, so, so in accordance with health and safety, um, where you do use a, a lever and weight. You've got some potential exposure for moving for moving parts in a lever and weight. So what we'd also recommend where you have a lever and weight um, is that you have an expanded mesh guard fitted to encompass the, the, the swing arm uh, of the valve. Uh, and this, this means that whenever non-return valves are used, oops, excuse me, whenever non-return valves are used with a lever and weight, um, a protective guard should also be specified so they don't damage anybody or that doesn't foul anybody or any, any equipment that you might have on, on site. So that's a that's a basically a simple non-return valve. I guess the next type of, of check valve is what we call a recoil valve. Um, and where check valves are fitted to multi-pump layouts, um, it's normal that when one pump shuts down, it might leave one or more of the pumps working. Um, and this can maintain a relatively high pressure downstream of the valve um, when it's shutting down, and it very invariably leads to a slam and subsequent damage of the valve. So for this reason, um, a recall check valve is often specified. And this has a faster closing speed uh, when it's fitted in these situations. Um, and, and this has a closing time of approximately 0.6 seconds. Uh, the slight variation on this is that you've got a um, an, op an opening and closing um, angle there, which is restricted to no less than 78 degrees. So it, <coughs> it will open and close but there is some there is some restriction on that uh, on that operation of this particular valve but they are um generally specified when there's multi pump multi pump situations because of the the speed of closing of this type of recall check valve and again just as an illustration um from a sangaban perspective this this illustration shows a, a standard non return valve uh, and then the various components that you can get with that um, and you'll notice there's a um, on the on the on the hinge pin there. There's an extended hinge pin that you can bolt the um, lever and weight to, which you also use to locate the guard on the side of the valve as well. So that's that's all of the accessories that you get with that valve, and that's what it looks like when it's assembled to enable the lever and weight to move uh, and be guarded to ensure that it's it's safe and it's not going to damage anybody. Moving on through the this this pipeline design that we're building here. The next valve that you might use um, is, is often called a gate valve, uh, and that's in a that sits in a pipeline route. Um, the function of a gate valve um, is to is to isolate uh, isolate systems, um, and basically there's a um, there's a European standard for these, which is EN 1074-2, or in the in the UK we work to British standard, which is 5163, uh, and the standard wedge gate valve for underground waterworks is the uh, if is what we call the inside screw. Uh, and what we mean by that is it's not a not it's a non rising stem, uh, which ensures that the stem thread is adequately lubricated by the water passing through the valve. Uh, and, and this is a fact which in age, which supports longevity and performance of the valve. So basically what happens with this valve, um, the stem rotates um, within a captive nut at the top of the valve um, to cause the gate to rise and lower. Um, so basically what this is, it's a, dop, it's a drop tight closure because it's resilient seated. Um, it's suitable for potable and treated water. Um, it shouldn't be used for prolonged flow control, 
you can you can open these to let um, a, a minimum or, or a minimum flow through for a short period of time, but you shouldn't use these for throttling or flow control because that's they're not designed to do that. And if that's the case, you could end up damaging the resiliency gate within the valve. Um, and normally these are clockwise, clockwise closing, but there are variations on this. We often get different water regions in the UK. Historic who had clock one region has clockwise, the region next door has anti-clockwise closing so that the regions know whose valve it is when you take the lid off the box and have a look um, in the hole in the ground. So there's some historical issues there about the, the closing direction, but typically now they're, they're clockwise closing. As I mentioned with this, the stem stays in place, the gate rises up and down the stem uh, and then closes to, to, form, a, to form a seal at the, uh, at, the, at, at the interface with the valve body. <clears throat> That's the resilient sheeted gate valve. We've also got what we call metal faced gate valves with a non rising spindle. Um, similar, very similar to the resilient seated, um, but these are generally recommended to be used with raw water and sewage because of the metal gate. It's got the ability to deal with any, um, let's call it contaminants that might lodge in sewage systems um, and, 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 and sit in the, the waterway and on the seats. Uh, and because of that, it's drop tight closed only when new, because when it's been operated a couple of times, if there's grit or gravel in a in a network, um, you can't necessarily guarantee that it'll be drop tight after use because the grits and gravels can um, you know, damage the surface of this valve. So you might get a very small seat of stuff of, of, of fluid coming through this. So it's not it's not drop tight after the first use. It can be used for solids, sewage with up to 8% solids. So it's a fairly um, wide ranging um, use. Um, it's not <clears throat> it's not recommended for open end discharge without modification. And again, what we mean by that is it's 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 shouldn't use this on a on an outfall and use it for throttling because it's not designed to do that. And if you try to use it as a throttle valve, again, you'll damage the you might damage the face. And again, very much like resilient seated. Um, <clears throat> Uh, clockwise, cl cl clockwise closure is preferred, but you can get these as anti-clock closing as well. Now, they're basically what we call non-rising spindle gate valves. The, 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 everything is encompassed within the body of the valve. The spindle stays where it is, and it's the it's the um, it's the it's the um, captive nut in the top that rotates to bring the the gate up and down. Look at the, if you like, the older versions of valves. These are where you get rising spindles. So what you've got with um, rising spindle gate valves is, a, is an outside screw. Um, and basically this is, um, <clears throat> these can be used for when the fluids, which may be foul, uh, foul, foul, foul systems, when they're prolonged, when they're exposed to that for prolonged periods, they might attack the stem. You'll want to take that stem outside of the valve, therefore protecting the stem for as long as possible. Um, so basically what this particular type of valve does, it leaves only the plain part of the stem inside the pressurized chamber of the valve and in contact with fluid. So you don't get that contamination of the, um, of the threads in the, in the, in the stem. Um, basically the stem is non-rotating and it basically carries the threaded portion outside the valve casing. And then you've got an external nut, which revolves, um, which, which, which imparts the operating thrust. Uh, and because the stem thread is external, to the valve casing, it has the advantage of permitting easy visual inspection and lubrication. Um, so basically, this rises out the top of the valve when you open it. So in its closed position, you can see the stem sitting at the bottom there. Uh, and as you open it, the stem rises and comes out the top of the valve. And due to this, um, <clears throat> headroom is normally required uh, outside a valve to enable that stem to rise outside of it. So we don't, as I mentioned earlier, we don't necessarily see a lot of these these days. People tend to use um, um, fixed stem rather than rising spindle, but they are still out there. And you might have some of these in service on on um, legacy um, treatment works that you've got in your in your network. So, in terms of valves, there's various methods of operation. Um, you've got in its simplest form, you've got what we call a hand wheel. Which, which, which sits on the top of the valve stem and you turn this like a steering wheel to open and close the valve. Um, and then you've got um, a square top, um, which is suitable for underground use with a key and lever or an extension spindle. So basically what you've got on that um, is a series of, of keys that you can use to open that uh, gate on the right hand side there. 
uh, when you can't get at it with a with a hand wheel. And as I say, if this is underground or in the treatment works um, within a within a, a chamber, you don't necessarily want to get into a chamber to operate it. So you'll have a square top and a um, a, a, a T operating um, system. So the different types of operating system here are key and lever, key ring and bar, and a T key. So as you can see, you can get you can get at that stem by a number of means to open that valve and close that valves. What you can also get um, on <clears throat> excuse me on on valves is um, what we call a capstan pillar. So if this valve is in a is, a, is in a treatment works at a, at a low level and you might be on a mezzanine or a platform or whatever it might be, you might want to operate that from a high level. So you can put what we call a capstan pillar on that higher level with a hand wheel on there and it supports the operating hand wheel um, or actuator at a convenient height for the operator. And this provides um, a bearing for the spindle at the point where operation is 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 uh, generated or generates side thrust. So the pillar can be also provided with a position indicator um, and, and various parts of kit and guide brackets um, that you can that you can use to accommodate this particular installation installation practice. Um, so <clears throat> the brackets are usually arranged to support the spindle from an adjacent wall and have a plain bearing surface or be bushed with a suitable material, um, gun metal, nylon, etc. Um, and if the extension spindle arrangement is long, the spindle is supplied in sections of let's say three meters uh, and joined by keyed or, or, or couplings, keyways or couplings. So you can you can adjust the height you're using at this, and you can actually again you can offset and go round angles with this as well with knuckle joints to get round uh, get round corners if you need to. So that's a, um, an operation via a, a, a capstan, <laughs> capstan pillar and an extension spindle. As I mentioned, these are for um, convenient operation of out-of-reach valves. Um, and then you can, you can manage misalignment of the spindle by uh, the use of universal couplings to get the line up correct. What, 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 what can also be available with um, capstan pillars is um, um, guide brackets. As I mentioned here, the guide bracket on the wall and then indicating scale on the pillar, which shows the operate, which enables the operator to accurately control the operation of the valve uh, and spindle guide brackets there shown on the side of a wall to make sure you've got some control over the extended spindle when you when you're using that particular valve. What you can also do with uh, with gate valves, you can you can put um, gearboxes on them. So. Um, the, the bigger a valve gets, or, or depending on the differential pressure on a valve, um, gearing can be used to assist the operator when the torque required to open it um, is a high, is a value higher than the safe working limit, which is um, 20, 25 kilograms force or 150 newton meters. So the different types of gearbox you can use on a on a on a gate valve, you've got a spur gearing, um, and they're usually used on a six to one ratio with the advantage that the centre line of the input is maintained parallel with the valve. Um, so that's a basically a spur gearbox. You still use a, you still use a, a keyway on that, um, but you get that, you get that uh, six to one ratio of operation. And then you've got a bevel gearbox where you might have a valve on a, on a vertical line. Um, you'd use a bevel gearbox because the valve's on its side. Um, and you can then employ that bevel gearbox to import the um, opening and closing torque onto the valves. And these are, um, these are available in the same ratios as the, as the spur gearing. <clears throat> and again, ob the object of the exercise here is to reduce the operating force to a, to a safe level. And the range of ratios you can get are 2 to 1 to 12 to 1. So there's quite a range there that you can use or you can employ. Um, and bevel gears are used for changing direction of an operating spindle. So that's just a, a summary of the way gearboxes can be used and employed. Um, going back to the, I guess, the old school, um, valves can also sometimes be operated by chain wheels. So again, where you might have historical installations of a valve uh, in a treatment works or a plant, it might um, it might be um, it might be a convenient method of operation when the valve's installed in an elevated position, um, and it can be operated by, uh, by by say by a chain and uh, a chain and wheel. Uh, and if required, again, you can fit a gearbox to this to improve the ratios of, of use with a with a chain and uh, a chain and wheel. But again, we don't necessarily see much of that about these days, and we certainly don't sell them as new valves now. But you might have experience of those on a on a on a system or a network that's uh, that's historical or being maintained. <clears throat> so that's that's sort of manual operation manual operation of gate valves. If we think about 
um, where we might need a bit more help, um, we, we, we can use actuators and gearboxes. Um, and basically, what we need to know to, to, to understand an actuated gearbox is to understand the difference between the upstream pressure and the downstream pressure. And this is known as the differential pressure in a pipeline system. And it's important to use the maximum differential working pressure when determining the size of a gearbox or actuator that's required to operate the valve because in certain circumstances that might be quite a it might be quite equal upstream and downstream pressure might be equal sometimes it might be going to an open end so you've got you might have 16 bar in a pipeline when you close the gate you've got 16 bar upstream pressure and you've got zero or one downstream pressure there's quite a significant difference there in pressures which will affect the um which will affect the opening torque because you've got that the effect on that gate is to try and push the gate downstream as you're opening it which will make it more difficult to open so you need to understand what those ratios are so you can get the right actuator and gearing on that on that valve for opening so when you talk about actuators um this is a device which is usually powered electric by electricity but can be pneumatic or hydraulic uh, and it allows remote opening and closing of valves so these can be these can be programmed or they can be managed from a control center um, in this case um, the actuator is mounted directly onto a valve um, and they are used to operate large diameter valves for which manu manual operation is inappropriate and it's obviously important to size the actuator according to the maximum differential pressure that you get in that system so our actuator can be supplied to suit a variety, of, a variety of power supplies and a variety of sizes and a variety of opening and closing torques. Um, they can be mounted directly onto the valve. Um, as I mentioned earlier, they can um, be, be sized according to the maximum working pressures required in the valve. So um, they are often um, specified by companies like Alma and, and Rotork, who are the experts in actuation. So when we supply valves that require actuation, we normally use those guys to sense check what we believe the specification should be so they can demonstrate or determine what the correct, um, what the correct actuator needs to be for a particular condition of a valve. So <clears throat> in terms of um, where we can use these, we can also pillar mount actuators. Um, it's basically sat on the top of a pillar there as it shows and it's 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 actuated remotely from the valve uh, on a pillar um, and these are particularly useful um, in areas that might be prone to flooding so you might have a valve that's in a, a chamber or a, a low point in a in a treatment works that might be might potentially be prone to flooding and you want to keep your actuator away from that so you can sit it on top of a pillar with a with a with a long spindle again so that the actuator stays out of harm's way but can still operate the valve um, remotely with the correct um, with the correct forces and then i guess for valves as well this this is becoming more important these days in terms of locking devices there are very um, simple types of locking devices available to ensure that you can't open a valve where you've got a cap top as you can see there's a there's a plate with a square hole punched in it uh, and, a, and, a, and a, an L-shaped bracket that comes up the side and basically in its simplest form just put a padlock through that which means you can't open that valve um, so you can lock it in the open position or you can lock it in the closed position and similarly with the with the um, hand wheel arrangement there's a there's a hook that, 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 that can bolt it through the hand wheel with a padlock and again that can be locked in the open or closed position to prevent un unauthorized access and operation of the valve. Um, don't often need these if it's a secure treatment works but if these are out in the field or um, somewhere that you've not got secure a secure area then it might be useful to consider that to stop people tampering with them which might affect the network <clears throat> so gate valves can also come in larger diameters um, and when you have a larger diameter what you might need is a bypass on it uh, and basically bypasses have been employed with medium to large gate valve, gate valves to enable uh, pressure balance to be achieved across the main valve uh, and able, enable it to be operated with relative ease because when that valve's closed you can close the bypass when you want to open it you might want to open the bypass first to enable um, uh, to enable some flow to go through to start to equalize the uh, the pressure in the system to make the, to make the main gate easy to open so basically um, it, it reduces the maximum operating force required if you have a bypass um, can also be used for slow filling of a pipeline um, and it can be integral as shown or fitted or on a pipe on a pipe with branch on a pipe branch 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a bypass is normally only used on a large diameter valve. Um, so when you get to sort of probably 600, sometimes 450, but mostly 600 plus tend to be fitted with bypasses by request. And when you get to really big sizes, 1,200, then they become fairly essential to equalize the, uh, the pressure across the, uh, across the, uh, um, the gate. So typical examples of what a gate valve looks like. Um, <clears throat> Three, three examples of gate valves here that Sangaban supply. On the left, you've got a resilient seated gate valve. In the middle, you've got a large diameter um, resilient, resilient seated gate valve. So there's a bit more body on that, a bit more, a bit more bulky. And on the right there, you've got a, a metal faced gate valve. So typically, they're the sorts of valves that we can supply to the industry that, that cover those uh, performance characteristics that we just uh, that we just looked at. Sometimes, depending on the diameter, you, we, we were often asked the question, should you use a gate valve or a butterfly valve? So on small and medium diameter gate, a small, small and media diameter pipelines, gate valves provide an economical solution to valve requirements. Um, in large diameter, in large diameters, gate valves can sometimes be bulky and expensive. Um, so often we're asked if we can use a, a butterfly valve instead uh, and with improvements of performance of butterfly valves and ease of ease of operation they're becoming more and more popular as the choice for large diameter pipelines now there's a few caveats around that um, they, they, they might have a, a slightly lower price than a gate valve they might be easier to install sometimes um, sorry yeah the, the cost of installation is is, is less um, there are fewer working parts in a butterfly valve. Um, they're generally easier to maintain again because there are fewer fewer parts. Um, the size and weight um, is on a, on a butterfly valve is generally less. As you can see there that picture that's just dropped in there. That's a that's a that's a gate valve, a large diameter gate valve with all the head works and top works on it. So if you installed that gate valve, you might have to put it on its side and have a, um, a bevel gearbox to open it or if you put it in vertically you'd have to have a either a dome built on top or a chamber that goes very deep to accommodate that valve so you could sometimes use a butterfly valve instead of that and have a, a much smaller envelope of, of working um, for that particular for that particular valve um, and again there's a low pressure low pressure drop with butterfly valves because as soon as you open the valve you start to equalize the pressure between uh, between sides uh, and it's easier to actuate. Um, butterfly valves are, uh, as I say, can be used as stop valves, uh, but with care, they can be used as as as, um, as throttling valves or control rates of flowing. Um, but you have to be mindful and careful when you do that. Um, they can be metal to metal or or metal to sorry, resilient to metal seated. Um, metal metal seat ga seat gated valves are more suited to throttling application, particularly if it's drop tight, closure is not part of the operating cycle. So they're a bit more um, a bit more easy to use uh, for for um, throttling. And that's because it's a metal it's a metal seat and it's not as likely to be damaged by, um, uh, let's say, erosion of, 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 of trying to throttle a valve. <clears throat> Resilient to metal is ideal for repeated drop tight use. Um, and can be used for throttling provided the throttling does not occur within the 10 degrees of travel from the short position so there are caveats on that in terms of using butterfly valves for throttling if we look at the um if we look at a detail of a butterfly valve um a high performance butterfly valve features a slight offset in the way the disc is positioned and this increases the valve sealing ability and decreases its tendency to wear so in this example it's shown as single offset the axis around which the disc rotates is not in the center line of the valve, but is offset to allow the sealing face to be interrupted to be an uninterrupted un circle, um, and this allows the gasket to be in one piece. What we see um, in this example is what we call a double offset valve, uh, which allows the disc to disconnect immediately from the surface, uh, from the seat upon opening, thus reducing the wear and tear. Uh, and seating torque. So there are two different types, um, single offset and double offset. Uh, single offset tends to scrape, if that's the right word, scrape the, the ceiling surface as it opens, whereas the double offset lifts off immediately and prevents that wear of the rubber uh, in the gate over time. An illustration of a, of a butterfly valve um, is this one here. So we've got um, 
a flange butterfly valve. In this instance, it's got a, an actuator, or sorry, a gearbox and hand wheel on the side to open it. So, uh, and we can supply these from PAM at 150 to 2000 millimeter diameter. So the bigger you get, the more gearbox and actuator you might need on the side of those, but that's a, a typical example of what one looks like. Moving forward, the next valve is, is a fire hydrant. Um, and the early, and these have, these have developed over centuries. In the early 17th century, pipes were laid in London, for example, and these were constructed of um, wooden, wooden pipes. And the method of accessing these was digging a hole, and drilling a hole in the wall of the pipe to fill the hole with water and take it away in a bucket. Um, so we've, we've become a bit more sophisticated since then. So we then had a what we call the London squirt valve and various references for fire hydrants and, and fire points, fire plugs. Uh, and you might still see these if you walk around, certainly London or some of the older British cities, you might see these posts on walls telling there's a fire hydrant at six foot depth or um, a fire plug at whatever point it might be. Early early fire hydrants became a little bit more sophisticated with a with a ball and float type valve in them. So we started to think about how we might control the flow of water with a with a float valve in a hydrant. And then these were developed um, to what we see these days um, to British Standard 750 Type One and Type Two hydrants, which are either end of line or in line on a on a riser piece. So basically, this is what the uh, this is what fire hydrants look like these days. You've either got a, a gate valve with a, 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 um, a 40, uh, sorry, a, a, a radial, a radial elbow, or you've got an inline um, gate valve um, that sits, sorry, hydrant, I beg your pardon, that sits on a, a, a riser piece in a pipeline. Type, we call type one and type two. So as I say, type, type, type one, um, sluice type hydrant became as known as the type one. So you've got a You've got a, a a gate valve with a with a with a with a fitting on it with an outlet on the top of the fitting, so you need to buy the the the, the gate valve and the fitting for type one. We've got now got what we call a type two, which is the more more commonly used version these days. Um, and this is all all one body of a valve, so you've got a you've got a fixed or a loose stopper. You've got a stem that rises and uh, rises and closes, um, and as that as that stem rises or that, that that gate rises, it allows flow through the outlet on this valve. Uh, and then when you close that valve again, you stop that flow back out of the hydrant. Now we've got a, a fixed and a loose stopper for two reasons here. A loose stopper, basically, what how that works is when you open the gate valve, the loose stopper will sit there until there's pressure. As soon as there's pressure in that pipe line, it'll lift that loose stopper up and allow water through. And then as soon as water stops flowing, it'll drop that loose stopper back down again. And what this does, it prevents contamination of water back into the pipeline. Um, so it acts, to, it, it, it acts to stop backflow. And what you get in a, in a hydrant of this type, you've got what we call a, a frost plug. So that if there is any water that's left in the hydrant after use, there's an expansion plug there to, to accommodate any, any freezing water that might be in that particular pipeline. <clears throat> so, Hydrants are fairly typically used for firefighting purposes or refilling fire tenders. But what we're seeing now is uh, a, a range of uses for hydrants. Um, and, and people are starting to use these as a means to access a network um, and, and for, for non-disruptive methods of repairing leaking mains, etc. So we're starting to see the use of, of through bore hydrants now, where um, certainly in angling water, for example, in the UK, they use through bore hydrants to access a pipeline so they can put measuring equipment in there or um, um, frost uh, ice picking or whatever it might be as an access point into a pipeline. So it, hydrants are evolving all of the time and becoming more and more sophisticated. Now, in terms of um, hydrant installation, typically that's a chamber with a hydrant in. It sits on the top of the pipe. It's got an outlet on it there, which is in this particular case is the London Red London round thread outlet and that can be connected to a fire fire tender or a or a or firefighting um, position um, and there are a number of different outlet types actually um, that are that are that were available and and might still be uh, might still be oops might still be referenced um, you've got bayonet types or screwed types uh, and in terms of the bayonet types, particularly in, in, in Ireland, there's a, there's a type called a Dublin, Dublin bayonet outlet. I don't know if that's still in use um, in Ireland at the moment, but that was one of the different types of outlets that we used to supply on the, on hydrants. We tend to use what we call the London round thread now because that's that's been, I guess, that's become the common 
the common one that's used, um, but there are there, there 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 may be historical valves in the ground that have got bayonet type outlets on them, depending upon the region and the and the fire, um, the different fire requirements in those particular regions. So again, looking at a hydrant, that's what it looks like. Um, this particular example is is what we call our squat version. And if you see there on the on the outlet, that that sort of um, gunmetal piece is the is the outlet type, and that's the London London round thread type of outlet. So again, from a UK perspective, that's been standardised as part of the UK fire um, fire services standard outlet. So every fire brigade in the UK has a connection that will fit to these to enable these to be used without uh, any sort of um, interface or or check. Uh, or, or challenge, let's say, because uh, if there's a fire, you want to be able to connect to it quickly, which is why it's been standardized to that particular shape and thread type. So in our in our little pipeline design piece here, the last piece we're going to talk about is the there's a flap valve. Uh, and basically the flap valve sits sits on the wall on the left hand side there. You've got all your other valves in the arrangement, but the flap valve acts to um, um, allow water into that into that well. Um, <clears throat> So basically what happens with the flap valve or a tide valve, um, it's a variant of a check valve uh, and it's designed to fit on a, on a wall or the end of a pipeline into a chamber or a sea wall. We often see these on, on, on outlets to sea or rivers. They'll, they'll bolt these to the end pipe or they'll bolt them to a, um, a sea wall to act as an outlet point for, um, excuse me, processed um, effluent. Um, basically what they enable what they allow to happen is the flow of a pipe or duct into a chamber or the sea, but it prevents backflow. Um, so tidal flaps. So basically, if, if it's low tide, it, the pressure inside the pipeline will allow this gate to open and 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 dump whatever's coming out of the pipe. As the tide lifts or the, the water level outside lifts and goes beyond the height of the gate valve, it'll stop the flow out of the out of the pipeline until the tide drops again uh, to stop to stop backflow up the pipeline. So basically, um, it, it acts on a on a sort of tidal um, tidal action. When the tide's high and covering it, the gate won't open. When the tide drops, it allows flow from the inside out. And typically, that's what a flap valve um, that's what a flap valve looks like. This is an example of a Sangaman Pan one. It's a, it's a double hinged version which enables a tight seal um, on that on that valve to stop um, inflow back up the pipeline. There are some other valves available, which I'll just touch on briefly. Um, we've got flow control flow control valves, um, which which are are fairly fairly complicated engineered valves, but you can use these to um, manage the flow in a pipeline. You can set these up so you might have ten bar going in one side. By the time it's gone through the flow control valve, you're moderating that to six, five, four, whatever you need to be coming out the other side. But they're quite complicated and engineered, and it definitely needs a conversation about these these type of valves. If they've got needle valves, um, which again can operate with a with an actuator or or a, um, a, a gearbox on the side of them. And again, these these are variations on a gate valve. There's a basically a, a needle valve that closes to create a seal. And then we've got um, pressure reducing valves, which again act in a pipeline to to moderate pressure. It's not quite as as, as it's not quite as effective as a flow control valve, but it's in there to 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 moderate pressure uh, in a pipeline uh, by by insulation. But again, we need to understand what the parameters of use are and what you're trying to control it to, so that the right one can be specified. So. That was a very quick whistle stop tour through valves, but hopefully it, it illustrates that they're an essential component of any pipeline. They control flow, they control pressure, they allow air to escape or enter a pipeline, they prevent backflow that might damage equipment, and they allow access to, to water supply uh, on, a, on, a, on a pipeline network. So hopefully the object of this presentation was to describe the types of valve normally used, describe how these valves work uh, and to define where and how they should be used. So that's it for, for today. 